me invite you to take your Bibles. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27. If you're new with us, we have been walking through Genesis um, in a multitude of series. Uh, and so we are finding our way over in chapter 27 this morning. You hear the phrase, no regrets, right? And it's usually kind of like a pet rally, rallying cry, you know, live life and have no regrets. A coach will say to the team, go and leave it all on the court, leave it all on the field, no regrets when the game is over, right? And uh, we think, oh yeah, pump me up, I'm fired up, no regrets, I run through a brick wall for this, right? So we think of it really as a rallying cry to, uh, for living life to the fullest, uh, really uh, doing our best effort. Uh, it, the idea of no regrets is the idea that regret is actually a waste of time and energy. Now here's the problem. That's not reality. <laughs> it is not reality to think that you're going to live life and have no regrets. Regret is real. Regret is the emotion that comes with guilt, of disappointment, and remorse. Regret is generally focused on this idea that there's some event, some choice, some something in the past that if I could go back and do it over again, or if it had been done differently or happened differently, that my life would have turned out in a different set of circumstances. Regret is the emotion that causes us to think, what if? What if I had taken that job? What if I had spoken to that person at school? What if I had married someone different? What if I didn't do this? Or what if I had done that? If only, if only, the what if game. Regret is related to choices, to decisions, and to relationships. Those are really the three areas that generate the regret. Choices, decisions, and relationships. Now the truth is we will all have regrets. There's something that we did that we regret. There's something that we didn't do that we regret. Regret is real. But that's not the problem. Because some of you are like, yeah, I need to get it. Boy, I tell you what, regret, that's my, that's my problem. No, it's not. Regret is not the problem. The problem is when you let your regrets keep you from moving forward in surrendered faith to Jesus. Regrets will shepherd you, and they will shepherd you away from Jesus rather than to Jesus. And so I think, and hopefully what we'll see this morning, is that this mantra of having no regrets is not only not realistic, it's not biblical. Because we're going to have regrets. So how do we deal with them? How do we move forward? How do we handle the regrets that we have? How do we try to navigate so that we limit the number of regrets that we're going to have? Right? And this is what we see in the, the family dynamic of Isaac. Right? I mean, listen, chapter 27 of Genesis epitomizes our statement around here that life gets complicated <laughs> because there are some family dynamics that are jacked up and messed up that we're going to see in, in Isaac's family this morning. Genesis chapter 27, pick up with me in verse 1. Now, when Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could not see, he called his older son Esau and said to him, My son. And he answered, Here I am. He said, Look, I am old and do not know the day of my death. So now take your hunting gear, your quiver and bow, and go out in the field to hunt some game for me. Then make me a delicious meal that I love and bring it to me to eat so that I can bless you before I die. Hey, guys, if you could um, adjust something here. I, I got a humming and a ringing in my ear. Verse 5, now Rebekah was listening to what Isaac said to his son Esau. So while Esau went into the field to hunt some game to bring in, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, listen, I heard your father talking with, his brother, with your brother Esau, and he said, bring me game and make a delicious meal for me to eat so that I can bless you in the Lord's presence before I die. Now, my son, listen to me and do what I tell you. 
Now hold will put a pin right there. Remember, we saw last week that Jacob, excuse me, that Isaac and Rebecca played favorites with their boys, right? And so Isaac favored Esau, good, 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 and Rebecca favored Jacob. All right, good. I just make sure we're all together there. So we see this favoritism, right? It wasn't that it was going to cause a problem. The problem culminates, and we see it here. Verse 9, go to the flock and bring me two choice young goats, and I will make them into a delicious meal for your father, the kind he loves, because y'all know the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Verse 10, then take it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. And Jacob answered Rebekah, his mother, look, my brother Esau is a hairy man, but I am a man with smooth skin. Suppose my father touches me, then I will be revealed to him as a deceiver and bring a curse rather than a blessing on myself. His mother said to him, your curse will be on me, my son. Just obey me and go get them for me. So he went and got the goats and brought them to his mother, and his mother made the delicious food that his father loved. Then Rebekah took her, his, uh, the best clothes of her older son Esau, which were in the house, and had her younger son Jacob wear them. She put the skins of the young goats on his hands and the smooth part on his neck. Then she handed the delicious food and the bread she had made to her son Jacob. When he came to his father, he said, My father. And he answered, Here I am. Who are you, my son? And Jacob replied to his father, I'm Esau, your firstborn. I've done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how did you ever find it so quickly, my son? And he, he saw, replied, excuse me, Jacob replied, because the Lord your God made it happen for me. Ah. Then Isaac said to Jacob, please come closer so I can touch you, my son. And are you really my son Esau or not? So Jacob came closer to his father Isaac, and when he touched him, he said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau, so he blessed him. And again he asked, are you really my son Esau? And he replied, I am. Then he said, bring it closer to me and let me eat some of my son's game so that I can bless you. Jacob brought it closer to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, please come closer and kiss me, my son. So he came closer and kissed him. Isaac's still not convinced, right? He's like, let me smell him. And when Isaac smelled his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. What every son wants to hear their father say, by the way. May God give to you from the dew of the sky and from the richness of the land an abundance of grain and new wine. May people serve you and nations bow and worship to you. Be master over your relatives. May your mother's sons bow and worship to you. And those who curse you will be cursed and those who bless you will be blessed. And as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob and Jacob had left the presence of his father, Isaac, his brother Esau arrived from his hunting. And he had also made some delicious food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, let my father get up and eat some of his son's game so that you may bless me. But his father Isaac said to him, who are you? And he answered, I'm Esau, your firstborn son. Isaac began to tremble uncontrollably. Who, who was it then who hunted game and brought it to me? I, I ate all before you came in and I blessed him. Indeed, he will be blessed. And when Esau heard his father's words, he cried out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me too, my father. And Isaac replied, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. So he said, Isn't he rightly named Jacob? For he cheated me twice now. He took my birthright, and look now, he has taken my blessing. Then he asked, Haven't you saved a blessing for me? But Isaac answered Esau, look, I have made him a master over you, have given him all of his relatives as his servants, and have sustained him with grain and new wine. What then can I do for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. And Esau wept loudly. His father answered him, look, your dwelling place will be away from the richness of the land, away from the dew of the sky above. You will live by your sword and you will serve your brother. When you rebel, you will break his yoke from your neck. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. 
And Esau determined in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are approaching, then I will kill my brother Jacob. When the words of her older son Esau were reported to Rebekah, she summoned her younger son Jacob and said to him, listen, your brother Esau is consoling himself by planning to kill you. So now, my son, listen to me. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran and stay there with him for a few days until your brother's anger subsides, until your brother's rage turns away from you and he forgets what you have done to him. It's like she doesn't even know how brothers work. (laughs) Then I will send for you and bring you back from there. Why should I lose you both in one day? So Rebekah said to Isaac, I'm sick of my life because of these Hethite girls. If Jacob marries someone from around here like these Hethite girls, what good is my life? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your mercy and your grace. And so God, this morning, would you help us to bring our lives in surrender to you? And we trust you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, very quickly, we want to catch up here. Genesis chapter 25, here's what we saw. We saw that God had a plan, right? God had a plan, has a plan, always has a plan, okay? When we say that God has a plan, we're referring to the sovereignty of God, right? Sovereignty, that that 75-cent church word that means that God is in complete control, right? So in Genesis 25, we saw that Rebekah had been um, barren, Isaac prayed for his wife to become pregnant. We saw it, that Rebecca became pregnant. Not only that, but she was pregnant with twins. And when she inquired of the Lord of what was going on inside of her, he said, you've got not just two babies. He said, you have two nations in your belly. They, and they're already warring with each other. And this is what God told her, remember? That the older will serve the younger. Okay, so before they were born. Now that's kind of curious, right? Because that's not the way that it should have been. It's not the way it was supposed to be. The older son should have been the one to receive the birthright, right? The double portion of inheritance from the father and would become the family leader. That's what we would have expected in the culture. And so it, it's curious that God would then say that the older would, be, would serve the younger. Now, it's not that God had a plan for Jacob, the younger, and not for Esau. It's not that God was overlooking Esau somehow and kicking him to the curb. Esau would still receive a nice inheritance. I don't know if y'all have noticed this or not in the, in the story of Abraham and Isaac and their family. They had a lot of stuff. Like, get it, receiving something as inheritance was not going to be a problem, okay? He just wasn't going to get as much as his brother. So Esau could still live and have a nice life. God had a plan for Jacob, and he had a plan for Esau. He has a plan, right? We would say he has a plan for each and every person on the face of the earth. That God has a plan means that God is sovereign. He's in control. Now, sometimes it it may feel like it does when you're riding in the passenger seat of the car. I am going to drive if we're going somewhere. Okay, now it's going to be a faith experience for those of you in the car with me. I don't shy away from that. I ain't hurt by it. You're not a perfect driver either. So suck it up, and move on. Okay, just because I have certain experiences as a driver that some of you do not does not mean anything <laughs> negative. All right, so here's what I say it's kind of like riding in the, in the passenger seat, you know. You, you're pretty sure that you're about to slam into the back end of whatever or whoever's in front of you. Can I get a witness, right? And so you do what the passenger in my car does, and you start steering and braking and slamming the door, right? You know, and you have pressed a hole in the car floorboard from trying to stop. You're pretty sure that you're about to crash. But the reality is, is that the driver is in control, Right? The driver has a different perspective. The driver knows what he or she is supposedly doing or about to do. All right? Don't ever stretch an analogy too far when you're trying to talk about God. All right? Our perspective as the quote-unquote pastor in in this life is limited. Right? So we begin with understanding that God has a plan. Secondly, we saw in chapters 25 and 26, not only does God have a plan, but God works his plan. Not only is God sovereign, but God is all knowing. Right? So God works his plan by his knowledge. God will not be derailed by mine and your disobedience or by our hesitation. 
God's stated plan for these two boys was what? That the older would serve the younger. Now, why would God do that? Why would God flip cultural expectation up on its head? Well, because God knows everything, and he's working to fulfill his plan. Well, what was it that God knew? Well, we saw that he knew, God knew that Esau would be impulsive. And some of you are thinking, impulsive, is that bad? It ain't good. All right? Esau's impulsiveness made him susceptible to the allure of instant gratification. He saw it, he wanted it. He felt it, he needed it. He thought it, he's got to have it. If he thought it, he said it, right? This instant gratification. And what that meant was is Esau was not dependable. And that's what we saw happen in Genesis chapter 25. Esau comes in from the field, right? He'd been working out in the field. And he declared in Genesis 25, he said, I am exhausted. He said it to his brother, right? He literally says, I am so hungry, I'm about to die. He says, I'm exhausted. Give me a bowl of that red stuff to eat so that I don't perish. Now, <laughs> Esau greatly exaggerated his circumstances, okay? He wasn't literally about to die. He was hot. He was hungry, and he was tired. He spoke out of that rather than out of reality. And so Jacob, being kind of the conniving younger brother that he was, saw an opportunity to pounce on this. And so Jacob offers to feed Esau, but he wants something in return. He wants that birthright as the oldest, uh, from the oldest son. Now we saw in Genesis 25 that Esau didn't hesitate. He didn't pray about it. He didn't even hesitate or, or hint at the thought that this might not be a good idea. Rather, he jumps all over the deal. And so what God knew is that spiritual priorities were not as important to Esau as his physical creature comforts. This is more than about brothers fighting over daddy's money or over a bowl of stew. This is about God preserving his plan for the redemption of all of mankind. So God has a plan. God works his plan. And then we see that God accomplishes his plan. The theological word for that is providence. That God is working everything to the end that he de decreed and determined. And so God accomplishes his plan. In Genesis chapter 27 and verse 37, Isaac said to answer, Look, I've made your brother, the younger brother, a master over you. So it came to fulfillment. But God also worked his plan in the long range. He was preserving the lineage of the Messiah. And so we know that Jesus was born, died, and redeemed all of, uh, provided redemption for all of mankind. So God accomplished his plan. So here we come to Genesis chapter 27. And with all of that in the background, right, let us keep in mind that God is the one that's in control. We're, what, we're reading this story almost like we know the backstory. You know, and it's almost like, ooh, don't do that. Ooh, don't say that. Ooh, <laughs> that's going to come back to bite you, right? And so we read this story with that understanding. So let's, let's draw, there's really four, I'm going to call them applications, right up front that I want us to get. And here it is. The first, don't confuse forgiveness and consequences. Don't confuse forgiveness and consequences. There are consequences for our choices and our decisions, right? And confessing our sin and receiving God's forgiveness does not always necessarily remove the consequences that come with them. So don't confuse forgiveness and consequences. Now listen, while God had ordained the destiny of this family, the people involved chose a sinful path to that destiny. And they suffered unnecessarily. I don't know about you, but as, I was, as I'm reading this story, I'm thinking it didn't have to be this way. This family did not have to wind up as, a, as, a, as a, the model of the Jerry Springer show. It just did not have to happen that way. They could have chosen obedience to God. They could have chosen a peaceful, obedient path and enjoyed God's favor along the way and enjoyed a harmonious family and enjoyed all that God had planned for all of them. They could have, but they didn't. Right? And that really is the story for many of us in the room and online this morning. We could have chosen 
one way, but we didn't. And it has led to regrets. And we begin to regret the decisions that we made. Now, here's a curious thought for you. When you th read the story, for those of you that are familiar with the story of Jacob and Esau, about how old, like what age bracket do you picture in your mind Jacob and Esau be? Young adults? T teenagers to young adults? Is that kind of what we picture in our head? Yeah. Let me blow that Sunday school picture out of the water for you because this, this kind of rattled my cage a little bit this week. Isaac is 137 years old at this time. He was 60 when the boys were born. Now, I know math is not everybody's subject, but I can do that. That means they're how old? 77. I know. 77 years old, still living at home. <laughs> 77 years old, still needing their mother to cook their meals and pick out their clothes, literally for Jacob, right? And some of you are thinking, what? 77? And then some of you are thinking, well, isn't it culturally like, you know, they would live with the family? Yeah, they might have lived on family land, but they should have been married and had their own family by this time. Right? I mean, these old boys have been hanging out. Oh, let me move on. Because <laughs> it's not in my notes, and that is always when I get in trouble. Some of you are like, no, preacher, that's when it gets good. Well, <laughs> stick with me. So Isaac, watch this. Isaac is outside of the will of God. He's being driven by the flesh. God had clearly said the older will serve the younger. And right here in the very beginning, Isaac says, I don't care. I like this boy the best. I'm going to bless him because that's what I want to do. He seeks to disobey God. Isaac is deceived by his wife. He is deceived by his younger son. And from this point forward, Isaac lives another 80 years. And so for 80 more years, he lives in this dysfunctional family dynamic. And then Isaac's story just fades to black. Jacob, excuse me, Rebecca. What a woman. She willingly deceives her husband. She betrays her oldest son. Being the father of four and watching the relationship between my bride, the mother of my children, and our children over the years, there is something that I cannot explain that is incredible about a relationship between a mother and her children. There's a dynamic there that I don't think anybody except a mom can understand. Right? There is a relationship and a literal connection that started with, between the mother and the child long before the rest of us. You know what I'm saying? Does it not break your heart? She, she said, you know, I'm going to deceive my own boy. In verse 46, we see that she gets exposed and she is in damage control. Notice what she said to Isaac. She said, I'm so sick of all this. I just, my heart is just broken. I just wanted our boys to get along. I just wanted them to grow up and be best friends. And we're all going, liar. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Right? She told Jacob, hey, go to your Uncle Laban's house. And in verse 46, she's in damage control, and she manipulates Isaac one more time. Would you bless the boy and send him away? What manipulation. There is no mention in the scriptures of there ever being reconciliation between Isaac and Rebekah. I don't know how it officially ended, but there is no passage of scripture that says... And they sat down and had a long talk, worked it out, went to a weekend to remember, dealt with their issues, forgave one another, and lived happily ever after. It doesn't say that.
Rebecca, her story fades to black. Then there's Jacob. He purposely participated in the deception. I mean, where did he learn it from? He learned it from his mother. He purposely participated in the de deception. He lied to his father. I don't know about y'all, but around our house, like lying is a capital offense around our house. Okay? Like, I just, it's, just, it's not necessary, and it will get you just close enough to the death penalty around our house. You know what I'm saying? Okay? And so it just, it just eats and breaks my heart here. Jacob lies to his father, so that makes him a what? A liar. He's a preacher. No, no, no. He's a liar. Look in verse 20. He had an opportunity to come clean. Isaac said, how'd you, how'd you, get the, how'd you find this and cook this so quickly? He said, oh, God gave me great favor and helped me to do it so quickly. He is full on lying. Jacob gets sent away, forced to flee for his life. Leaves town with nothing but the shirt on his back. He never again sees his mother. It's interesting. What did she say? She said, go away for a few days and let your brother's anger subside. Now, I don't want to spoiler alert anything, but in a few weeks, we're going to find out. He actually spends at least 14 years with Uncle Laban. And speaking of Uncle Laban, crazy Uncle Laban, if you think that Jacob is a manipulator, Uncle Laban has a PhD in deception. Okay? And if you don't know the story, you got to come back. It, it, you just won't believe what this rascal would do, right? And so think about this. Mama sent her favored son to go live with the crazy uncle from where she learned how to be a deceiver and a manipulator. Jacob is about to meet his match in Uncle Laban, and Jacob's going to wind up getting a taste of his own medicine. And then there's Esau. Poor Esau, right? No. Esau despised his own birthright. He reacts out of the flesh. He wanted a bowl of stew. He was deceived by his own mom. He's about ready to throw hands with Jacob here, right? It says that he consoled himself with the idea that he was going to kill his brother. He seeks to take of his life of his brother by revenge. It will be 20 years until these two boys see each other again. Regret, right? Regret. Wasted years. Wasted time. Do not confuse forgiveness and consequences. Secondly, regret needs grace, which requires repentance. This is why having no regrets is not realistic and not biblical. Look in, in chapter 27 and verse 12. Jacob said to his mama, uh, look, my brother is a hairy man, uh, and I'm a man with smooth skin. Suppose that my father reaches out to touch me, then I'll be revealed to him as a deceiver. Jacob says, I'll, I'll seem like a deceiver. I'll, I'll seem like a liar. Guess what? You are a deceiver, Jacob. You are a liar. You will seem like that because you really are. Regret. Jacob has regret. I believe later we'll see that he looks back and I believe he regrets lying to his father. He would seem like a deceiver because he was. Listen, in that moment right there in verse 12, there is a hint of conviction. Jacob knew right and wrong. He knew what he was doing was not right. He knew that he shouldn't, but he did it anyway. Just like you and me. There are a lot of things we know we shouldn't do, and we do them anyway. And we wind up at the end called regret. That's where many of us get hung up at, right? We have regret for the things that we did that we knew we shouldn't have done, and we wish we could go back and change it. He's more worried about being found out than he is about the fact that he's a liar. Notice that. He knew that it was wrong, but he was more concerned about what everybody was going to think about him. Your reputation is what other people think of you. Your character is what you know you really are. And in verse 20, he's exposed as the spiritual fraud that he was. 
He was exposed as a spiritual fraud who was using God to further his personal agenda. What did he say? Uh, his daddy said, how'd you get that so quickly? Oh, God. God in heaven helped me to get this. He was using God to further his own personal sinful agenda. Now, I know y'all won't believe this, but, but Christian people do the same thing today. Unchristian people do the same thing. And they say it like this. Hey, you know, I've, I've, I've prayed about this. You know, I've, I've been praying about this, and I just, I just feel like God is, you know, is leading me to, to do X. And I'm like, mm, I don't think so. But I've prayed about it. Well, you, didn't, you may have prayed about it, but you didn't listen. Because what you're talking about doing is a clear contradiction of the Scriptures. It's going to lead to regret. Now, next week in Genesis 28, we'll see Jacob. Act. Jacob gets saved in, Jack, in Genesis 28. Spoiler alert again. And so we see this response. In Genesis 28, he reflects back on all of this, and you see the regret that will weigh down on him, and he actually repents and will come to faith. There's a response, right? There's a response to the guilt. Instead of just doubling down in his, in his regret, he brings it to the Lord. Uh, then with, 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 uh, with Isaac, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 20 says this, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith? Anybody else, like, does that, does that not rub against the grain for anybody else besides me? By faith? Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. This doesn't look like a whole lot of faithful action, in my opinion. So look back at Genesis chapter 27 and verse 33. Well, 32. Esau's come in. Isaac said to him, who are you? I'm Esau, your firstborn son. Look, verse 33. Isaac began trembling uncontrollably. Isaac trembles uncontrollably. He realized what had happened. I believe that, it, 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 that Isaac was thinking, I blessed the wrong boy. When actually, he blessed the right boy. I believe that in this moment, when Isaac is trembling uncontrollably, I believe that faith was birthed in Isaac at that moment. I believe that Isaac realized, I believe that there was an awareness, and he said, well, how can you say that faith was birthed in him? Because if you then read the rest of that chapter, how he interacts with Esau, think about it. He's, he, he's kind. He's compassionate. Right? Right? We see, we see this more father figure coming out. We see him trying to shepherd and to disciple Esau, right? So I, I do believe, I do believe that there was a change in Isaac in that moment. Unfortunately for Esau, he held a grudge. Verse 41 says that he planned to kill his brother Jacob. He lived with no regrets. I believe when Isaac was there with Esau, I believe all of that played back then. I believe Isaac had regrets. What have I done? What have I done to my boys? Have I messed them up? What have I done? Oh, the wasted years. Oh, if I could go back and do it over again. I'd parent them differently. Oh, if I could go back and start over, I'd do things differently. Now, here's the good news. Jesus died to cover all of our regrets. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10, the apostle Paul wrote, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. But worldly grief produces death. You see, it's not, it's not realistic, it's not biblical to think that you're going to live without regret. That regret, that sorrow should lead to repentance, which Paul says leads to salvation and life. 
He says that when you double down in the regret and you don't repent, it leads to death. So listen to me, students. Regret is not the end of the world. It is an opportunity and a moment to come clean before God and to confess and to repent and to be cleansed and to be restored and made right again. Thirdly, Trust the word that you heard, not the feelings that you feel. Trust the word you heard, not the feelings that you feel. Look in verse 22. Verse 20, Isaac said, hey, come a little closer so I can touch you. Are you really my son, Esau, or not? Verse 22, so Jacob came closer to his father, Isaac, and when he touched him, he said, what? The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. In verse 22, Jacob tried to mimic his brother's voice. I am not going to try that. I mean, think about it. If you were to call to the house and if my dad or myself or my brother answered the phone and we just said hello right short you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference of which one of us it is there's a very similar sound in that right I was so excited <clears throat> I was a teenager when I could answer the phone and people would say hey Mel that's my dad who's here this morning right he said, hey, Mip, I just wanted to pretend like I was him, right? And so maybe there was a little similarity, but it was enough difference that in this conversation, Isaac said, something's not right. Isaac noticed that it sounded like one boy and felt like the other. What he felt deceived him. The only thing that didn't betray Isaac in that moment was the word, the voice that he heard. He said, I hear Jacob's voice, but my feelings betray me. Listen to me, dear friend. Part of dealing with regret and part of trying to miss regret is to trust the word that you heard. Trust the word that you hear. What God has said is true and right. Trust it and obey it. Our feelings are not substantial enough to negate the truth of God's word. And so the criteria is that we must use the 100% revealed will of God or we will be deceived. So whatever it is that you're thinking about in your life, here's the question to ask. What has God already said about my situation? What has God already said about the thing that I'm thinking about doing? What has God already spoken about this? And then fourthly, fight the battles on our knees, not with our hands. Fight the battle on our knees, not with our hands. Rebecca's plan backfired in her face. We waste a lot of time and energy and resources and relationships because we fight against God. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you at the proper time. Pray for God's wisdom and God's timing. Pray to know what it is that God is doing and what it is that God wants you to do and pray that you will know when and how to step into it. But we fight the battles on our knees, not with our hands. There are two realities in my life that, that do not contradict one another, and I believe it's true for you as well. One, on one hand, I can have regret about something I did or didn't do, while at the same time receiving the wisdom and the blessing of God for the season of where I'm at now. In a very simple way, I'm not here to confess everything. When I was graduating seminary, the church that we serve, I loved our pastor, Bill Boyer. He's now in, in heaven. And Pastor Bill came to me 
just a few months before I was graduating. And he said, hey, Michael, he said, I want to ask you, he said, we're going to add uh, a certain staff position on the staff here. And he said, I want to ask you if you would be willing to step in that role and take that job. I was so excited. I mean, God created the moon and Pastor Bill helped hang it in the space. That's how I see, saw Pastor Bill. And, 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 and I thought, how incredible. But at the same time, all I could think of was I wanted a pastor. And so I made a choice. I chose not to accept what Pastor Bill was offering. Now, looking back, as I have many times, the course of my life and my family and my ministry experience would likely have been very different. But I believe the Lord gave me a choice, and I made a choice. Looking back, I have regretted over the years not taking advantage of the opportunity that was put in front of me. So on one hand, there is, can be regret. While same, simultaneously knowing that I today am right where God has willed for me to be, doing exactly what he has willed for me to do in the place that he has led me to be. So regret does not negate continuing to walk forward with the Lord. I can see how the past 20 years might have been different, but I see how they shaped me and prepared me for where God has me today. I mean, I've often said that our family had to go to Florida to be able to come to Perry. God is sovereign in it all, and he works all things, the good and the bad, together in such a way for my good and his glory. Now, I may regret what I did or what I didn't do, but that does not move God off of his plan. He does not have to move to plan B. God brings his will forward sometimes in spite of what we do or we don't do. So we have regrets. God has grace and mercy. So this morning, the invitation is this. To exchange, to trade your regrets for God's grace and His mercy. No regrets is not possible. But regret cannot keep us from moving forward in faith with Jesus. I invite you to just close your eyes right where you're at. Regret is a tool of the enemy, the devil, that he desires to use to suck away the joy, and the peace, and the hope, and the confidence of walking by faith with Jesus. This morning, I plead with you, if you have never trusted Jesus as your Savior, our pastors are going to be right here at the front as we stand and sing in just a moment. I plead that you'd step out, come forward, and say, I, 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 need, I need to be in the right relationship with God. I need to trust Jesus as my Savior. Maybe you just need someone to pray with you as you, this morning, they're, they're, you know the, the, the regret and the guilt. You just want somebody to pray with you. Come. But God in heaven is more gracious and more merciful than we could ever possibly imagine. And there is no regret that His grace and His mercy cannot heal, cleanse, and restore the life. So Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, help us this morning to come to You. God, we are grateful, we are thankful. Let us be overwhelmed by Your goodness and mercy to us. Let us come running to You in Jesus' name. Amen.